I believe with all of my heart we are living not just in any times but the end times. And that being true, the next event on God's calendar is the rapture of the church. There's not one thing that needs to happen biblically for the rapture to occur. When it comes to the second coming, a separate event, there are things that still need to happen before the second coming. But the rapture could happen today. Let me give you an overview of Revelation. And it'll kind of put into context uh, a timeline. Revelation 1, John gets a vision of Jesus. It's incredible. It's like this sevenfold picture of the glory and power of Jesus. It concludes with John being overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord, falling at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the one who was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and hell. So John, you're, you're on this island. You are struggling, but your story folds into the larger story. Anybody in this room, if you're in a season of struggle, I, I pray for you, I stand with you, but I encourage you to know that your story folds into the larger story of the Alpha and the Omega, the victor, and so you will be made more than a conqueror. You are on the winning side. Be faithful. God's gonna bring you through. Revelation chapters two and three is called the church age. It's where John wrote by the Holy Spirit to seven different churches and they received the challenge of the Lord. We are right now in the church age. When you get to chapter four, you see the rapture of the church. This is chapter four, verse one. After this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. And from that point, the church isn't referenced again. So, Revelation 1 to 3, 18 times the church is referenced. From chapter 4 on, it's not because the rapture has happened. Right after the rapture is the beginning of the great tribulation. That's Revelation 6 through 19. I believe strongly in a pre-tribulation rapture. Let me show you Revelation 3.10. So team, take me there, please. Back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. The hour of trial is another way of talking about the great tribulation. I'm gonna keep you from this hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Jesus spoke of his return. Paul spoke of the rapture. You won't see the word rapture in the Bible. You see, you know, the New Testament was written in Greek, and so the Greek word is a catching away, which we use the word rapture to describe the, the coming of Jesus to rapture his church. So sequence. Vision of Jesus, church age, that's where we are right now, rapture of the church, great tribulation. The great tribulation is a seven-year period. Daniel, Old Testament leader and prophet, he received the vision of 490 years of future activity. It's called the 70 times seven. And with amazing detail, he wrote then what would unfold over those 490 years. To the detail, what he wrote has happened up to 483 years of it. Seven years left, that's the great tribulation. We're standing on the brink of the rapture of the church. You need to be ready for the rapture. It could literally happen today. The great tribulation will last seven years and at the end, it ends on what's called the Battle of Armageddon. And that is when Jesus will return. And you can read about it in Revelation uh, 19 and 20. I'll just give you this one part of verse 16 of Revelation 19. He's coming and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written and it's this King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And that's the second coming, followed by then the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is followed by the, ju- the great white throne judgment. I talked about hell last week at the great white throne judgment. That's where people will be separated from God for eternity that rejected all the opportunities to come to know Jesus. And their eternity will be spent in what the Bible calls the lake of fire. After the great white throne judgment is the new heaven and the new earth. God will make all things new. He'll wipe every tear from our eyes. And and you can read about this newness and this eternal newness that will be our existence. The body has been rejoined with the spirit. And we are there in this unfolding perfection called heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. So I'll say it again. You get the vision of Jesus. This is revelation in five minutes, but it needs about five months. But here's the way you can think about it. The revelation of Jesus, the vision of Jesus, the church age, that's chapters two and three. Chapter four, rapture of the church. The rest of those chapters up to 19, the great tribulation, ending with the battle of Armageddon, second coming. Then you have marriage supper of the lamb, followed by the great white throne judgment followed by new heaven and new earth. If the rapture could happen today, we need to be ready. I don't want anybody to leave this place not prepared. I'm very thankful for parents, uh, the, the parents that God gave me. They loved Jesus. All I ever knew was a home that, where Christ was the center. As a result, we went to church faithfully. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I watch them be involved in church, and I have such a respect and an honor for all of you that are just great, faithful Christians, and you make part of your Christianity faithfulness to coming to church and serving through the local church. My heroes are those kind of people. I didn't have pastors on my dad's side or my mom's side. Uh, The people that shaped my life are just great, godly, faithful Christians who honored the Lord and faithful to coming and serving through the church. That's what shaped me. My church had a strong emphasis on the imminent return of Jesus. And it scared me as a kid. So when I was a kid, I would hear these messages and, and I just always thought, I'm, I'm not going to make it. And there were times I didn't fully understand all the grace teaching that was going on in my church. There were times I thought, man, I think the pastor just said Jesus is coming and none of you are going to make it. (laughs) They had what I called a mean anointing. And it just kind of felt that way. That's because I was a kid, didn't understand the whole thing. Um, But there were times I would go home, especially on Sunday night, there would be this intensity about the coming of Jesus. And And I can remember some Sunday nights, it was hard to sleep. I'd have nightmares because I'm like, I'm not going to make it. It It's like Jesus had a chalk in one hand, a racer in the other. You do one thing and you get erased out of the Lamb's Book of Life. And so I, I was just a kid. And so along 1972, this movie came out called Thief in the Night. I'm getting triggered right now. (laughs) That movie showed graphically about the coming of Jesus, the great tribulation. If you didn't take the mark of the beast, you couldn't buy anything to eat. You didn't take the mark. They, They put you in the guillotine, like the guillotine was in this movie. I was gripping the pew. We didn't have seats. I was gripping the pew back then. Like, dear God. And... I go home that night, next day I go to school. I catch the bus at the end of my street, you know, about walking like from the back of the church to this platform from my house to where I would catch the bus. Got home that afternoon, the bus keeps going this way. I go down my street, I get about halfway down, didn't know it, but my friend on the bus brings out his trumpet. (laughs) And he blasts that trumpet. And it fills that bus and floats out the wind and just kind of covers our neighborhood with this trumpet blast. I can't see that bus. I'm down my street. Now, I just saw a thief in the night. Now, this is the truth, folks. Immediately, I thought, I got left. 
and I sprinted home because my brother, older than me, got home earlier, rode a different bus. I thought, if he's home, everything's good because I knew he was going. <laughs> he, was, he, just, he just loved Jesus. I knew he was going. I burst in the house screaming his name, Phil, Phil. He's always at home. He wasn't there. <laughs> I called my mom's work, Smith Paper Company, multiple lines, never get a busy signal. And some of you are too young to even know what a busy signal is. <laughs> but I got a busy signal, like communications are going down. I then called my memo, 8790717. Y'all have talked about it, saint of God is a rotary phone. I thought the great tribulation will be over before I even <laughs> get the number dialed. Her phone starts ringing, no answer. My grandfather often worked in the fields surrounding his house and so I thought uh, maybe he's outside. And so it was a rule if you ever wanna go and I went to their house almost every day they had to come and get you or you had to be taken. You were not allowed to walk. But all rules were off because Jesus has come. And, <laughs> and I got to figure this out. And I took off running down Kasachi, turned left on Tomahawk, half mile, turned right on Fawcett Road. Another half mile, and I got to Mamaw's house, burst through the door. She's not there. Run out into the fields. My papa's not there. So in my little head, two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left, and I've been left behind. I run back to their house, storm in the house, open up what would be the pantry, get a loaf of bread, open the refrigerator, get a Coke, and went to where my papa kept his pocket knives. And I grabbed a pocket knife, which was against the rule, but grabbed a pocket knife and headed to the tree line behind the field tucked in under this tree with a loaf of bread, a Coke, and a pocket knife, knowing that the Antichrist was going to find me and say, you want something to eat? You're going to have to take the mark. And I'd have to take him on with a pocket knife. This is true if I've ever said it. And I'm far enough away from the house that I couldn't hear when my aunt brought my memo and papa back from something. And when my memo goes in, a neighbor up the road calls and says, I... I just need to tell you, I think, not long ago, I think I saw Ronnie just like running down the road. Because that was unusual. That was an area I was never. And Mamma said, well, I knew like the refrigerator door is open and the drawer and, you know, Joe, her name, his name was Joe, Papa, the drawers, somebody's been in our house. So they come out hearing that and come out back looking for me and I see them, and I take off running to them with my bread, my Coke, and my pocket knife. And I'm just saying, I thought the rapture had happened. I'm crying. And Mamaw took me up. She said, baby, I'm going to get you ready for the rapture. She goes, you're not ready for the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> or you wouldn't be scared, but I'm going to get you ready. Uh, I, sitting under that tree, some of you are going to remember this. The only thing in my head was I've been left behind and I was hearing the words of the song, wish we'd all been ready. Do you remember that? I mean, it talks about kids crying. and it, it, there, There's one verse, husband and wife are in the bed and, and she turns over, he's gone. She's been left behind. Well, okay. <laughs> Just letting you know, it's the song. And it's like, wish we'd all been ready. So, Memo said, I'm going to help you get ready. So here I am, 58 years old, and I want to tell you that in 1978, the sequel of Thief in the Night came out. It's called Distant Thunder. I have not seen it. I won't see it. <laughs> it won't be shown at this church. <laughs> oh, man. John 14 says, don't let your heart be troubled. If you know Jesus, you're ready to go. If you don't know Jesus, you need to be troubled. And a loaf of bread, a pocket knife, and a Coke will not get you through. I'm telling you. 
So what helps us to get ready is exactly what we see in Revelation. You take the message to the seven churches and you get a game plan for being rapture ready. So let's go. Number one, to the church at Ephesus. The challenge was return to your first love. John is saying, check your heart. So let's have just a moment to check our own heart. Like things can layer our longing for God. Sin can do that. Stuff can do that. We just get all about acquisition. Um, stress. There are things that can cause us to drift. And so John is saying, check your heart. If there's ever been a day that you love Jesus more than adjust, he called them to repent and to return to their first love. To the church at Smyrna, he wrote, remain faithful. This church was being persecuted. And when I talk about persecution, I'm talking intense persecution. I do believe that we're seeing the intensifying of persecution in our country. It's nothing like what others have experienced, but it's intensifying. And there's going to be a demand placed on us to be faithful, even when it's not easy, like a gritty Christianity, a courageous, determined Christianity a determined church that says, no matter what, I will be faithful. These people were under the persecution of Domitian and they, they suffered greatly if they didn't worship him. They suffered greatly if they didn't bow to all of these altars set up in their community. And at certain times, if you weren't bowing and expressing your worship, listen to this, to the one name given, Domitian said, it is my name given, whereby men must be saved. He had four and 20 elders that he paid to walk around and give worship to him. Now, if you read Revelation, the four and 20 elders, all of that causes the lights on the dashboard to start going off. And these Christians would be faithful. And John wrote back to them. And John said, I've gotten a vision, and you can read it in Revelation. John gets called up here, and John sees the throne. That's Revelation 1, and then again in Revelation 4. And John writes back and says, I've seen the throne, and Domitian is not on it. Jesus is on it. Be faithful. <laughs> to the church at Pergamum, he wrote, reject false doctrine. And... These things that used to be more prominent in other places are now prominent right here in our own country where sound doctrine is challenged more than ever before. Progressive theology is trying to rewrite scripture. And it comes like this, that if the Bible was written today, Jesus would condone and, and the word of God would condone a man marrying a man and a woman marrying a, wo a woman because the biblical principle is morality and monogamy. The sin is immorality. And if two people, man, man, woman, woman, man, woman, if they will just be in covenant, if the Bible was written today, Jesus would condone that. That is a lie. That is false doctrine. That is editing the scripture. You don't bring it forward. It stands on its own. And so, more than ever before, we're gonna to have to reject false doctrine. <laughs> to the church, and by the way, let me, let me say this, thank you for clapping right there. And over these months where I've kind of raised some, some major issues, uh, there would be people say, man, I, you know, I hope you don't get too much kickback for saying that, very little. Very little kickback. And I say that to say this because most people are reasonable. Most people get it. It's just these people that don't, the people who don't get it, they're very, very loud. They're very loud. And it makes you think there's a tsunami of all these people that are just, no, there's way more that would believe this. It's just the spirit of the age keeps you from thinking that. And so 
He says to Thyatira, remove impurity. They were tolerating Jezebel and the spirit of Jezebel and sexual promiscuity and immorality. And as I really looked into that word impurity, what, what the result was immorality, perversion. But what was happening is they were wanting theology to gravitate to their heart rather than their heart gravitate to theology. They were letting their feelings be the leader and wanting God and scripture to align around their feelings. And the result was impurity because they were being led away of their own lust, but they were wanting to rationalize, condone, and, and let it find place as though it would be approved of God. And so the Lord says through John, remove the impurity and make sure your heart is always being transformed to scripture. To the church at Sardis, he says, renew your purpose. Let me just give you some of verse two, verses two and three. He says, I have found your deeds to not be complete. And the persecution perhaps was causing them to back off from their purpose. And it was too important. And I just, I, I want to encourage somebody here. Don't let anything keep you from serving Jesus. If you've been hurt, if you've been dismayed, if you have been disillusioned, I'm sorry. Ask the Lord to give you grace, to give you help. But don't sit in the grandstands and just let somebody else serve. Church hurt often causes people to withdraw. Church hurt is real, but just know the church is full of people and hurting people hurt people. But if it happens in church and with church people, there is this assignment to the church, like the church hurt. And it seems to be deeper. It's like friendly fire. Like you, get, you shoot your own. So all these things, I, I, I just appeal to you, let nothing keep you from the grace and healing of Jesus for whatever you've gone through and serve. There's a dream that God has given you. There is a life of gifts and talents and a skill set. Serve. Fulfill your purpose. I'll remind you that Joseph had two sons. And one of them, the, the name meant delivered, the other meant faithfully serving. And when Jacob was going to put a blessing on his sons, usually the older received the blessing, but he crossed it over and placed the blessing on the younger. That had never been done before. And he placed the, the blessing on the one serving and you will be delivered. And the whole point was to Joseph. Joseph, when you were lied about, falsely accused, in prison, you kept serving. And because you kept serving, you've been delivered. If you, God, you heal me, I'll serve. There is a place to just set your heart apart to be healed. There's a point to start serving again because that's where God completes the healing. As you start giving again, you receive something that's a completion to your healing. Amen. Number six, Philadelphia. This is a church that had an open door that no man could shut. And so the words were respond to that open door in the power of the Holy Spirit. He said, you have little strength. That could mean they were under persecution and it wasn't easy to make the most of the opportunity. Another interpretation is this. You have such a big opportunity, you're gonna need the power of God. Your strength compared to the opportunity is little. My strength, the power of the Holy Spirit in you, matches your moment. So it's a call to press into the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can maximize the opportunity. Philadelphia was this strategic global center that whatever happened there would spread. It's the importance of where God has placed you. You have a place. It is a significant place. It starts there and it spreads. 
So be empowered for the significance of where you're placed and the significance of what your influence will be from that place. He says to this church, you have also kept my word. They didn't back away, but it's more than just they kept committed and obedient to the word. They made disciples, that's what it's saying. The answer to deconstruction, the movement that is trying to question God and, and everything about the Bible, the answer to deconstruction is discipleship. So more than ever in these last days, we must be a disciple-making church. And we'll keep people ready for the rapture. Finally, number seven is to Laodicea. And this was the challenge to repent of lukewarmness. Lukewarmness. I've talked for months now, it seems, about spiritual passion. Don't think it's normal to have low spiritual passion. That's what the enemy wants us to, to think. That we normalize just kind of this coasting spiritually. That has never been the heart of Jesus. We, we are a people to be in our first love. So bracket the seven churches. It starts with return to your first love. It ends with don't be lukewarm. And it, it focuses on the relationship with Jesus and our love for Jesus. Because from there will be the motivation to obey when it's difficult. To hold fast to the word of truth. To have big faith for the opportunity that God is giving us. To make disciples and to be more motivated to make disciples than ever before. What brackets all of that is love Jesus with first love, never get lukewarm. If you've left your first love, repent, return. If you're lukewarm, repent, get fired up again. Amen? Isn't it brilliant how the Holy Spirit put the scripture in place? All you have to do to be ready for the rapture is follow the game plan that he gave us in the church age. Love him, love people. Hold to the word, disciple people from that word, and don't quit risk taking. Don't play it safe. Dream big risk, let a spirit of generosity fall on the house. Because one day when we stand before the Lord, and team, I, I, I didn't request this, perhaps you could help me. Could we put Faith's picture back up from Malawi? Just put her picture back up if you can. Give them a moment to find that, and worship team, you can join me. So you may get a chance to go to Malawi, and I encourage you to go because it is impossible to really describe all that Jesus is doing there. But when we get to heaven, faith is going to be in heaven. Because there was a church that knew it was a matter of life and death. And you would sow financially into places that you may never go, into people that you never may, may meet until then. I have been to Dhaka City, 21 million people, just this city of such dense population. And only one third of 1% have a clue about Jesus. And I've got this vision that we would stand at the judgment seat of Christ where we are rewarded and that there would be tens of thousands, even millions of people from Bangladesh that are there because they received a witness through the ministry there supported by this church way over here in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Capture the vision. Capture the vision. foster kids that come into this church and we just love them, give them gifts, and maybe that would cause them to think about Jesus in a way they've never thought about him before. 
we get one life. We get this precious opportunity to live on purpose and for a purpose. I want you to stand with me and I invite you to close your eyes in the presence of Jesus. And I want to start with an opportunity for people who need to get saved to accept Christ. If today you're not ready for the rapture, you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior, and you realize how important that is, would you just raise your hand right now and say, include me, I need to get saved. Just raise your hand, I'll pray for you. Anybody, say, I need to accept Christ as my personal Savior. I don't want to miss a hand. If you're watching online, same question to you. Do you need to get saved? We have people that will help you. Secondly, to every believer, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? Did one of those seven challenges challenge you? Lord, we stand in a sacred moment, and I pray that you would do a work that, that I couldn't do in a hundred years. Do a work right now that would cause somebody to live differently, to live strategically, to live with an eternal perspective, to live with an urgency. God, help us to have a, a completely different understanding of our vision, a whole different attitude toward the vision. Jesus, thank you for your imminent return and that moment that you rapture us so that where you are there, we may be also. We're not troubled. We're not afraid. We are excited. And Lord, we look forward to the opportunities between now and then. I pray over us that these end times would not happen to us, that we would happen to these times. That's what you always wanted, a church that was storming the gates of hell. You've given us the promise they can't prevail against us. Stir people in this room to serve as never before. If they're serving, give a, an increased burden for the, that group they're serving, that ministry they're serving. An increased burden of what it's really all about. Thank you for doing that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.